right, so let me start recording. So this is Multivival Calculus Math 150, Lecture 13. And what we're going to do today is we're going to talk eventually about Newton's method. But to get there, we're going to first go through uh, some other topics in mathematics and talk a little bit about how do you find the right statistic, the right quantity to study. So many times you just told do this. If you want to be a trained monkey, that's fine. But eventually, if you want to be the person who's giving the orders to the trained monkey, you have to figure out what is worth studying. And so I want to talk about that today. So this is a talk that I've given many times. The first time I gave this, I actually gave it at Williams and Mystic, which was a lot of fun. They let you bring your family and they give you free tickets to the aquarium. Has anybody been to the Mystic Aquarium by any chance? Yeah, when I say they give free tickets to the aquarium, it turns out it's not to the Mystic Aquarium. It's to the Boston Aquarium. So my wife and two kids were at the Mystic Aquarium and I'm about to give my talk and I'm going to meet them at the aquarium afterwards. They call me up and say, oh, by the way, the tickets are for the Boston Aquarium. So always look at what you're getting. You know, they did give me tickets to the aquarium. So I want to talk about fractal geometry. So how many of you have seen or at least heard the word fractals? Right, so by the end of today, you should see a little bit more and have a little bit of a sense of where they come from and that they're actually quite common in the world around you. Okay. All right, so this is, if you want more detail, there's a lot of papers, you know, the slides I'll make available, as always, uh, long history of fractals and not just mathematics, but also in economics. So if you go to the additional comments and you Google fractals, if it's not there, let me know and I will you know, send you some stuff if you want to read about applications of fractals to modeling markets. I'm going to skip a lot of the stuff over here. The main issue in a lot of fractal geometry is extreme sensitivity to initial conditions. I might have talked about one of my students who now works on climate change models. And he is not saying that climate change happens. He is not saying that climate change does not happen. What he is saying is that a lot of these models are extremely dependent on initial conditions. And so I came up with the following way to explain this uh, with my son this weekend. Let's imagine that you always hit the ball to the same spot in baseball and that fielders are not allowed to do shifts. They have to start in a certain position. And let's say that the fielder, you always hit to the shortstop, fields the ball and goes to first base and he gets the 0 0.001 seconds before you do. What is your batting average? Zero. Let's move first base just a little bit closer. So you now get to first base 0 0.002 seconds faster than before. What's your batting average now? A thousand. So you go from every at bat as an out to every bat as a hit. This is extreme sensitivity to initial conditions. If you look at how long it takes you to run to first base, as I move first base a little bit, what happens to how long it takes? It changes by a lot or a little, by a little. What if I move it 20 miles? All right. you no longer, you're not gonna be able to maintain the sprinting pace for 20 miles. So if I move it very far, then your average speed is going to change greatly. But if I move it just a small amount, the amount of time it takes is going to vary continuously. But if I look at whether or not you're safe or out, that's going to have a sharp change in behavior. It's going to be extremely sensitive to initial conditions. A lot of sports are like that. They try to change, they try to choose the parameters just so that the game is competitive and interesting. It becomes interesting. Where do you put, for instance, the three-point line in basketball? If it's too easy to get a three-pointer, that's going to change people's strategies. Okay, so can anybody define dimension? You know, the mathematical concept of dimension. And if you can't define it, give me some examples. What is dimension? Okay, so good. One thing is the amount of directions. So what are the possible values of dimension? Okay, so we have one, we have two, we have three. Could we have four dimensions? Yeah, we won't be able to visualize it that well here, but we could have four dimensions. You talk about the directions you can go. Well, I have infinitely many ways I can go. I'm getting my steps in today. I'm choosing all these different angles right now. So would you say that I live in an infinite dimensional space in this classroom? So you mean more than just how many directions you can go. There's another word you have to put in. 
What kind of directions? Well, but I could do four dimensions or five dimensions. So it's, I mean, I have infinitely many directions I can walk right now, but I don't want to say that this is an infinite dimensional space. You'd want to put in independent directions. That I have two directions, say, north, south, east, west. And then I can write any direction as a combination of those two. And you'll do a lot of that in linear algebra. So it seems like a natural way to define dimensions like this. Here is a more mathematical way. So r to the n means I have n triples of real numbers. Let's let s be a set. And again, I will make these slides available. If we dilute, if we dilate s by a factor of r, that means take every point and multiply all of its coordinates by r. So if I take i equals two, I've doubled every coordinate. So if you have a sphere of radius two and you dilate, I'm sorry, if you have a sphere of radius one and you dilate it by a factor of two, you now have a sphere of radius two. If I dilate it by a factor of one fifth, I now have a sphere of radius one fifth. So we say that if you dilate s by a factor of r, if that gives you c copies of your initial set, then the dimension d satisfies r to the d equals c. This is a beautiful mathematical definition. I see a couple of people like squinching their eyeballs right now. That's what you should be doing. We had such a wonderful concept of dimension that we understood. Why would you do this? Well, this allows us to talk about things mathematically. Now, not every set when you dilate it is going to give you uh, some you know, exact number of copies of it. So what you might do is you might have a local definition. I look at a small local patch of my set. And when I do this, what should we do about this definition? We should try to see if it makes sense, if this matches our intuition. Can anybody give me a set where we could try this out and see what it gives? What would be a good set to test this on? So what's the easiest dimensional set you know of? Easiest. One dimension, so give me a good one dimensional set. What's a good one dimensional set? Zero, just like a discrete set of points? Not quite, I don't want a discrete set of points. Close. I want a nice one dimensional set. Give me a one dimensional object. I'm sorry? Okay, so y goes there would be what? That'd be the entire x axis. That'd be something that's infinite. So if I dilate that, I get itself back. So I want something finite. So you're close. Give me a finite one dimensional set. We integrate over this all the time in one dimension. So it would be a good one dimensional set. Good. So let's do like the line from zero to one. Right? Start off with a line. This is the most simple thing we can do. If we dilate it by a factor of three, so rather than having a line from zero to one, we now have a line from zero to three. We have three copies. So I'm trying to solve r to the d equals c, r equals three, c equals three, so d must equal one. All right, the line has dimension one. How much is tuition be three? Right. What should we do after this beautiful success in one dimension? What should we do next? Two. And what object would you take for two dimensions? So if we did a line in one dimension, so we could take, it's also known as a square, right? Take a square. We dilate it by a factor of three. Now we have nine copies of the initial square. So when we solve r to the d equals three, r equals three, c equals nine, you have nine copies. So the dimension has to equal two. All right, this working definition gives us the dimension of a square is two. This is exciting. What would we do next? Cube, and we get the cube has dimension three. I'm not gonna bother drawing. I'm gonna do something a little bit more interesting now. This is one of the more interesting sets in mathematics. It's called the Cantor set. So you start off by taking the interval zero, one, and then at every stage, you throw away the middle third of what's left. 
So initially I have zero, one, and I throw away the middle third. I throw away everything from one third to two thirds. And so that leaves me two intervals. I'm just drawing each level underneath. So I now have the interval from zero to one third and the interval from two thirds to one. I now throw away the middle third of what's left over. So I'm gonna throw away the interval from one ninth to two ninths and the interval from seven ninths to eight ninths. And so if I just do this a couple of times, you know, I'm throwing away, I'm throwing away, I'm throwing away. There's a lot of really interesting stuff going on here. It turns out this is equivalent to writing a number in base three, where you have no ones in its base three expansion. And it turns out you can show that this is, can be mapped to the entire interval zero one. You take the sum of say, a n over three to the n and replace it with a n over two divided by two to the n. You convert all the threes in the base three expansion to two, so you have two to the n, and then you divide the numerators by two, so they're now all zero ones rather than zero twos. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, it turns out, between this set and the interval zero one. It's okay if that was fine. It basically has as many points as the interval zero one, but arranged in a very different way with these giant gaps. Can anybody give me some bounds on the dimension? The dimension is at least this much and at most this much. It is okay to give me a smart ass weak bound. So can anybody give me an upper bound for the dimension? The dimension is clearly no more than so what would be the largest the dimension could be? So where does this live? Where did we start? We started not, not zero, we started with what? So why, why is the dimension at most one? Yeah, we started with a line and we threw away things from the line. We shouldn't get a dimension that's larger by throwing things away. The dimension should be at most one. What should be the smallest value for the dimension? The dimension should be at least, at least zero. So the dimension should be somewhere between zero and one. It turns out you can prove the dimension is the log of two base three. And let's look at it as follows. If I take my Cantor set, so again, this is just showing, this is the first iteration, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. So this is showing the sixth iteration. If I take what I have and I multiply it by three, I dilate by factor three, then this part over here from zero to one third expands out and gives me a whole copy of the initial set. Then everything from one third to two thirds, there's nothing there that expands out and gives me nothing from one to two. And then everything from two thirds to one expands and gives me another copy of the Cantor set from two to three. So if I dilate by a factor of three, I get two copies. So using this as my notion of definition, my notion of uh, dimension, I get three to the D equals two. Okay, I can use logarithms. So the log of two base three is my dimension. And that's about 0.63. So this gives us a first example of a set whose dimension is not an integer. And stuff like this really does come up in the real world. How many of you have seen Pascal's triangle? If you want to take the derivative of x to the n, where n is an integer, this is how we do it. We look at x plus h to the n. And when you expand it out, the nth row of Pascal's triangle is the coefficients you get in x plus h to the n. We're going to play a little game. Wherever you have an odd number, put a dot. Wherever you have an even number, delete it. Okay? So dot if odd, blank if even. And so if we had just one row, well, Pascal's triangle is just one, so we just get one dot. If we have four rows, the only even number in the first four rows, you know, zero, one, two, three, is just the number two. So you would get something like this with just this one thing deleted. If we go to the first eight rows, it looks like this. And so I wrote a program a couple of years ago to uh, generate stuff like this. You can click over here later if you want and just you watch the video. And what it does is it adds more and more rows. Well, actually, we should probably be able to. Do and so I did not put in cheesy music. I apologize. You know, most people when they do fractal stuff, they do cheesy music. Um, Later on, I actually redid the program so it does things horizontally rather than, so it does things vertically rather than horizontally. 
when you are doing something like this, it's very important to you know, think about exactly what are you doing. So I am trying to draw Pascal's triangle and I want to do more and more rows. And when I do more and more rows, well, the problem is my screen would have to get bigger and bigger and bigger to accommodate this. But I don't have an infinitely large screen. So what I always do is I always resize things so that no matter how many rows I have, it is always showing uh, just the same um, screen block. And so it's now should start you know, drawing um, the dots. You can see initially these three dots over here, the first three rows, and it should be drawing more and more. I'm absolutely shocked right now at how bad the internet is uh, right now for this video. And what movie does this look like? Beginning of what famous movie? The Close with Star. So was the Imperial Star Destroyer. Right. Would have been wonderful if it was a fractal shape that was attacking the Rebel Alliance, but wow, it's, it is incredibly slow right now. I will find out later why we are having so many interruptions. What if not if I rewind it, it would be a little bit better. All right. But what you can see is you, know, you get this beautiful self-similarity in terms of what's going on. Stop the share. Go back to the screen. And so here's a couple of images of more and more rows. And you can see the pattern stabilized. And what you could do is you could try to think of well, what's the dimension? Well, if I take it over here, if I multiply by two, then this part over here, this upper triangle, would rescale and become the whole thing. So this would give me one full copy, another full copy, another full copy. So if I do R equals two. I get three copies. So the dimension would be the log of three base two, which is a little bit less than one, which is a little bit less than two, but greater than one, which makes sense. It lives in the plane, so the dimension is at most two. I have this boundary line over here, it's all ones, so I have a full line, so the dimension is at least one. So the answer makes sense. It's somewhere between one and two. There's lots of other things you can do. Um, you know, this is just going through the calculation I was mentioning ago, and you, know, you get that it's the log of three base two, which is about 1.58. Uh, one of my students did a nice calculation. You know, I'm not sure if this was new, I, I doubt it, to show that no matter what number you give me, any positive real number, we can always find a set that has that existence. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can generalize what we've done. You know, if you're interested, there's a bunch of links you can follow later. You can, instead of looking at things mod two, you're even or odd. You can look at what's the remainder when I divide by three and color it accordingly. Is it zero, one, or two? You can get lots of different interesting patterns. Here's four. You can ask, does the number of primes matter? I mean, number three is prime, four is two squared, is five. One of the applications, which I don't want to go into too much detail, is trying to figure out what is the dimension of the coastline of a country. So can somebody give me bounds for the dimension of a coastline? What do you think the dimension of the coastline could be for? Between one and one. One and three. So you're being very safe by saying three, because you live in the three dimension. You can probably move the three down a little bit to two. So the dimension of a coastline could be between one and two. Which countries do you think might have a higher dimension coastline than others? So, so an island might not really matter because that's separated. But what was your second thing? Yeah, so which countries? Maybe I think it's a better example Finland. And what book talks with pride about Scandinavian coastlines? Cultural extra credit. You want to give you 42 hints? The Chica's Guide to the Galaxy. So they talk about you know, the coastlines and all the fjords in the Scandinavian countries. And so what you can try to do is you can try to calculate what is the length of the coastline and you can look at different size sticks. So in the first one, we're doing Great Britain 
and we're using a stick that's 200 kilometers. Then we use one that's 100 kilometers, then we use one that's 50 kilometers. And we see that the length is changing significantly. Why do you think the length is changing? Well, because the stick is smaller, we can now take into account the little crevices, the ins and outs, the fuels, and stuff like that. Um, you, know, you can do a similar calculation. It's called the Cox snowflake. You take the straight line and very similar to the Pinter set, you throw away the middle third, but rather than just throwing it away, you then put an equilateral triangle jutting out. And it's a nice calculation to show that this will give you an infinite length, but it will be a finite area. So this will be a nice you know, example of uh, dimensions 1.26. Okay, so chaos. So much of math is about solving equations. I might have shown some of this already. Have we talked about solving the cubic and the quadric in this class? Okay. So if I give you ax plus b equals zero, you're thrilled. This is not much of a challenge. You subtract b from both sides, divide by a, and we've solved it. If I give you the quadratic, well, okay, it's not too bad. We all know the same song quadratic formula negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Not a big deal. How many of you have seen the formulas for the cubic or the quartic? How many of you have seen a formula for the quintic? Okay, this is just a good check to see who's honest. There is no formula for the quintic. Once you get to degree five and higher, there's no longer a closed form solution for the answer in terms of the coefficients of the polynomial and radicals and stuff like that. So here, are the three solutions for the cubic. I could make things a little bit nicer, but I prefer to just have it in its full glory. Without loss of generality, what can I assume about A? I can always adjust so A equals. One, you know, I have a non-zero cubic term. So A is not zero. I can divide through by A. And let you know b prime equal b over a, c prime equal c over a. So without loss of generality, I might as well assume a equals zero. You can also replace x by translating. It's a nice exercise. And you can show you can always tweak it so that the x squared term is zero. So I could simplify this a little bit. I could set a equals one and b equals zero. It's still going to be a mess. By the time I get to the quarter, I can really only show one root on the screen. You know, and this is with reducing the size of things a bit. And again, what could I set A to for this one? I could set A equal to one, and I could again translate and make B equal zero. So again, your know, good exercise for today is go through and try to see that you can choose, you can translate, you can replace X with say Y plus R and just translate things, or maybe Y plus T and just translate things so that you now have the cubic term vanishing. So we want to try to find where a function is zero. And we're going to have to do this numerically. So let's say we know our function is continuous and we know it's negative near zero and we know it's positive near one. So what must be true? Crosses Good, it crosses zero at some point between zero and one, at least once. It could cross many times, but it has to cross at least once. So we're going to use the divide and conquer method. And so this is similar to, I can guess, and this is a good trick to do if you have to amuse little kids. I can guess your birthday in 10 questions. But if I'm wrong, you have to say earlier or later in the year. So do I have a volunteer? I will not go all the way to find your birthday, we'll just stop the process. Okay. Is it January 1st? Earlier or later? January 2nd? January 3rd? This is really stupid. Right. How long could it conceivably take me to get the birthday? Yeah, 366 tries. And in my Cal 2 class today, we actually talked about the birthday problem where it's more convenient if you don't have anybody born on February 25th. And so, but we do have to allow that possibility. Were you born on July 1st? Later. So now with that one question, I've eliminated about half the year. Were you born to so July, August, September? Let's go with October. Well, actually, July and August both have 31 days. So I'll go with September 30th. Yeah. Damn it. <laughs> so just say no because it's been. Oh, well, we can't tell who will say yes, so they just don't care. 
So, but you can see each guess is eliminating half the possibility. And I was tweaking things a little bit. You know, I know July and August are you know, both going to be those 31 days, so we can do it you know, a little bit like that. So every time I guess, I have my uncertainty. So the idea is, you know, if it's negative at A and positive at B, look at the midpoint. If you happen to be right, wow, wonderful. Your first time in two decades. Uh, if not, then you look at, is it positive or negative? If it's negative, it's somewhere between the midpoint and B. If it's positive, it's somewhere between the initial point and A. Is it possible that you could have a root in both intervals? You know, could we have a root between zero and one half and a root between one half and one? Absolutely. This just guarantees there's at least one root. And so you know, if we're trying to find uh, something and I know that f of 0.5 is two, I would now look at f of a quarter and so on and so on. So let's take x squared minus three. So I want to solve x squared minus three equals zero. You know, the roots are plus and minus the square root of three. I want to actually calculate what is the square root of three. And so I want to figure out where does x squared minus three equals zero. And I know one squared is one, two squared is four. So it's somewhere between one and two. I then look at 1.5. I see f of 1.5 is going to be um, negative. So it's now going to be somewhere between 1.5 and 2. So then try 1.75. 1.75 um, is positive. So it's somewhere between 1.5 and 1.75. And after 10 iterations, I know my square root of 3 is somewhere between 1.730469 and 1.732422. And the correct answer is about 1.732050807, and so on and so on. So with 10 iterations, I'm pretty close to getting uh, 1.732. I'm not quite there yet. You know, I don't even have three digits accuracy. Who here is a computer scientist? Popular? How many megabytes in a gigabyte? 1,024. If you know your prefixes and suffixes, how many should you go from giga to mega or mega to giga? It should be 1,000. But your computer scientists are terrible at languages that have you know, more than five letters in their title. You have C, you do something like that. But you know, why do computer scientists get to say 1,024? Rather than a thousand, like the rest of us. Yep. So two to the ten is a thousand twenty-four. That's almost a thousand. And so it's just very convenient to work in base two. And so they'll say, "Oh, look, a thousand twenty-four is so close to a thousand. We'll let you do it." And this is why, if you're downloading big files legally, you know when you see how many megabytes it has, you know, when it gets close to like 990, 991. It will then like shift to like 0.9 gigabytes or 0.99 gigabytes because it does exceed the thousand megabytes before it hits the one gigabyte. So every 10 iterations of divide and conquer gives me another three decimal digits. So if I want six digits accuracy, I have to do this 20 times. Okay, it's not horrible. All I need to do is I just need to be able to tell is by function positive or negative. That's not that big of an ask. And all I'm assuming is that my function is continuous. So when you're doing methods, you always want to ask what is needed to make it work. All I need is continuity. What class is this again? This is not a hard question. Guys. What class is this? Calc 2. What? No. <laughs> See, I'm paying attention. It's not Calc 2. It is Calc 3. This is the third calculus class. At this point, what should you want to do? Use calculus, right? So there's two ways to use calculus. You can do what or what? Integrate or derive, right? So we probably want to have a function that we can either integrate or differentiate. And so instead of assuming that my function is continuous, maybe I should assume something a little bit more. Maybe I should assume it's differentiable. And the hope is that if I assume differentiability, I can get a better result than I would get if I just assume it's continuous. How many people have taken the stats class? Or plan on taking the stats class? 
How many of you have heard of the central limit theorem? Okay, so in calculus, what's the big result we have? Our main theorem is the fundamental theorem. So in probability, they say central rather than fundamental. It's the same thing. You don't get a title like this without being you know, truly worth knowing. And so the central limit theorem kicks in and talks about the sample mean converges and becomes normally distributed about the true mean. There are weaker versions of the central limit theorem that don't require as much assumption. They don't give as good results. Not surprising because they're not assuming as much. The hope is the more you assume about what you have, the better results you can get. And so if we assume our function is differentiable as well as continuous, the hope is we get a better result. And that's where Newton's method really shines. By assuming more about the function, we get a much better answer. And Newton's method is one of the things that's actually used all the time to calculate things. Um, I'm going to assume no one here has taken linear algebra, as this is a prerequisite for linear algebra. But you know, sometimes people do some linear algebra before you. You will learn about something called eigenvalues. And theoretically, we can find eigenvalues by solving for when the determinant equals zero, and you can get a polynomial of degree 10,000. It's a large matrix. Nobody ever solves a polynomial of degree 10,000. There are numerical tricks to use. And it's worth knowing how are things actually computed in the real world. When you push the button on your phone, you know, what is it actually doing to do the computation? Right, so what Newton's method does is assume the function is continuous and differentiable. We generate a sequence of points that will hopefully converge to a root. And it goes as follows. Given some guess xn, let's calculate the next guess xn plus 1. And the way it works is we look at the tangent line to the curve y plus f of x at the point xn. It has slope f prime of xn, and it goes to the point xn f of xn. So we get the tangent line y minus f of xn equals f prime of xn x minus xn. This is point slope form of the line. So where does this cross the x-axis? What's the value of y when it crosses the x-axis? Zero. So when it crosses the y-axis, y equals zero. So x is then our next guess, xn plus one. And we get xn plus one is xn. Oh, good. That's our previous guess. Minus f of x over f prime of xn. What better be true about f prime of xn? It's not zero. So hopefully, we're at a place where f prime of xn is not zero. OK. So let's show a little bit what goes on. So. Here is some curve y equals f of x. Here's some point x naught. I draw the tangent line at x naught, and I see where that hits the x-axis, and I call that x1 my next guess. And then have I mentioned shampoo mathematics yet in this class? What are the instructions on shampoo? Lather. Rinse, lather, repeat. Or lather first, then I always thought it was lather, rinse. Is it, is it lather, rinse? OK. I'm pretty sure it's lather rinse. <laughs> Although if you do lather rinse with P, would you be okay? You might just be off on that first cycle, but then I think you'd fix it on the next one. Self-correcting. It's, it's self-correcting, I think. Um, I unfortunately cannot comment as to whether or not it looks like it's self-correcting because that's not something as a professor I'm allowed to discuss in public. So this is the shampoo method of mathematics. You have some idea, you keep iterating, you keep iterating, you keep iterating. For divide and conquer, we kept iterating by dividing in half and looking at what's going on. For Newton's method, we keep taking the tangent line, see where it hits, and play it again and again and again. So here would be the next iteration. And you can see with just two iterations, it looks pretty close. It seems like it's really converging quickly. And so we can use an algebra. Let's say f of x is x squared minus 3. When you do the algebra, it simplifies at the end to xn plus 1 is 1 half xn plus 3 over xn. That's what you get when you plug into this formula. Your f of x is x squared minus 3, f prime of x would then just be 2x. When you plug that in and do the algebra and solve xn plus 1, this is what you get. Whenever you have a formula, you always want to ask, is it reasonable? So imagine I took 100 for my first guess for the square root of 3. We all agree that this is a horrible guess. If I take 100, what would be the next guess approximately? We started with 100, the next guess is approximately 1. So xn equals 100, xn plus 1 would be approximately. I'm sorry? No. So we'll take xn equals 100 in the formula of 1 half 
accent plus three over accent. No? So accent is a hundred. What's a hundred plus three over hundred approximately? No, a hundred. This is a hundred plus three over hundred. It's a hundred point zero three algebra. Fortunately, most of the problems are going to be calculus, not algebra. Right? A hundred plus three over hundred is approximately a hundred. Right? A half of that is approximately fifty. Right? So if I start with 100 as my guess, my next guess is around 50. If I put in 50, there's a chance to be D. What would be my next guess after 50? About 25. Then if I put in 25, it would be about 12 and a half. Then about six. All right, now when I put in six, so I get six plus three halves, okay? That's 6.5 over two, okay, 3.25. And now when I do the next one with 3.25, three over 3.25, that's now significant, that's almost one. So after a while, the three over xn does start to matter, but initially it's not a big deal. What would be a wonderful value of xn if you were happy and lucky and you happened to get this? What would you love xn to be? Would be the best value possible. What are we trying to find? What are we searching for? Which is what? So what's the root of x squared minus three? Zero. No. When does x squared minus three equal zero? So what value of x makes x squared minus three equal to zero? Zero. Square root of three or negative square root of three. So what would be a really interesting choice for x on If we happen to try this for x on Yeah, what would happen if we put an x n equals square root of three? We get root three plus three over root three. Three over root three is root three. Root three plus root three is two root three. Divided by two is root three. So if we are at the root, we stay at the root. And that's good. So if you happen to hit the root, you stay there. And then the hope is that if you're not at the root, it moves you to the root. And so this is basically what made me I'd move more towards being a mathematician than a physicist when I was an undergraduate. This was you know, one of the homework problems I got in my analysis class, and I was just amazed at just how fast this works. So if I want to guess the root of square root of three, my initial guess is two, which I think we can all agree is not a great guess. The first iteration gives seven fourths, which is 1.75. That's pretty close. It's always going to give a fraction, a rational number with this method, with this input. Next, I get 9756, 1 1.73214. The correct answer is 1.73205. Just two iterations. The next is 18,817 over 10,864. 1.73205080. The correct answer is 1.73205080075. We're off by 0. 0.000000. I think another 0, 025. With just three iterations. With five iterations, I've listed it down below. You've got to go all the way down to here before you see a difference in our iteration. And we have it as a nice rational number, which computers can work with beautifully. It is incredible how powerful Newton's method is. With five iterations, we have more accuracy than we can actually use. You know, like 11 digits, I think, is equivalent to measuring the distance between Los Angeles to Boston to within the thickness of a human hair. And for what we're doing, it doesn't really matter if it's the thin part of the human hair or the long part. You know, it's accurate. This is amazing how well it works. Every time you do one more iteration of Newton's method, you double the number of decimal digits for calculating something that's square root of three. So divide and conquer. 10 iterations, I get three digits. Another 10 iterations, I get three digits. Newton's method. Every iteration, I double the accuracy. I double the number of decimal digits. Amazing how well this works. This is the power of assuming more. By assuming the function is differentiable, we can do tremendously more than if we assume the function is just continuous. Not every function is differentiable. We saw when we did the method of least squares, the absolute value function is not differentiable. This hopefully gives you an idea of why we always try to work with differentiable functions. 
you know, this is your third calculus class. There should be some dividends. So let's play a game. I'm going to take the polynomial with x squared minus one. I'm going to write it as x minus one, x plus one. It's not that hard to find the roots. You know, the roots are at negative one and one. And I'm going to apply Newton's method and I'm going to color every point on the line. I'm going to color it red if it converges to negative one. I will color it blue if it converges to one. And I will leave it uncolored if it converges to neither. Does anybody want to tell me which points they think will converge to the root one? Anything above zero. And in fact, if you look at xn plus one, if xn is positive, it stays positive. That doesn't mean it's going to converge to one, but we know that anything that's positive can't converge to negative one. Similarly, if you start off negative, you stay negative. So before doing any calculation, I can just quickly look at this at a high level and see what's going on. There's one number that's still left. What do you think happens to zero? Okay, why won't it converge to anything? Like More than the slope. Look at the formula. What happens if you try to put in zero? Yeah, it's under fact. We're not allowed to even play the game at zero. So you are absolutely correct. <laughs> everything that's negative will converge to the root one. Everything that's positive will converge. I'm sorry, everything negative converges to negative one. Everything positive converges to one. All right, let's go a little bit further. Let's look at complex numbers, x cubed minus one. Can anybody give me a root of x cubed minus one equals zero? One. So that means x minus one divides this. We can do polynomial long division, which everybody, of course, remembers. So there's no need to talk about it. So, or if you remember the formula for the difference of two cubes, it's x minus one times x squared plus x plus one. You can then use the quadratic formula in fact. And so we get three roots. The roots are one. Negative one half plus i root three over two, negative one half minus i root three over two. And so if I put them in the plane, I'll call them red, blue, and green. And I want to ask, let me play Newton's method. And now let's color all the things that converge to the root at one, blue, all the ones that converge to minus a half plus i root three over two. Let's color that red and similarly for green. Can anybody give me a rule to tell me how I color? Color the ones blue if they are. So one is positive, and then how would you choose which ones are colored red? So positive is not the best generalization. So that seems to be the most natural generalization of what we had before. So let's split the plane up into three regions. Everything that's closest to blue is colored blue, closest to red is colored red. Here's the picture. It's somewhat white, but near the boundary, all hell breaks loose. And you can be down over here, and you're closer to both the red and the green root, but you're actually colored blue. It turns out that this is a beautiful fraction. And so we were talking about dimensions and whatnot, we're talking about extreme sensitivity to initial conditions. Depending on where you start, you can have wildly different behavior. Do people want the cheesy music if there's cheesy music? Okay. I don't know if this one has cheesy music. This one does not have cheesy music. So this is just zooming in on what is going on. Why do you think it looks black in the center? Yeah, so things are undefined there. It's also equidistant from all three of them. This should be, you know, by symmetry, there should be no way to figure out which one it goes to. It becomes a real challenge to actually calculate some of these polynomials quickly to evaluate this many points. If I give you a polynomial, the way you normally evaluate a polynomial is 
you know, you take X and if you have like X cubed, you would cube your input and then multiply by its coefficient. Then you would square it and multiply by that coefficient. It turns out if you do that, it takes too long to do these pictures. You need faster ways of evaluating polynomials. Maybe later in the semester, we'll talk about faster ways to evaluate polynomials. Okay, so going back to over here, uh, you can look at other complex sets, and this is just giving you a little bit of a sense of what you might see in future math classes. You know, I have some map fc of u is u squared plus c, where c is fixed. And I can keep iterating. So I start off with zero. And so fc of zero would be c. Then I take that, call that z1, and I apply my function to it. So I would get c squared plus c, then c squared plus c squared plus c, and so on and so on. And I'm going to color all the c's such that when I do this, it stays bounded. That the size of my number doesn't go off to infinity. If it goes off to infinity, I'm going to color it. And the color is going to depend on how quickly it goes off to infinity. So this is the famous Mandelbrot set. So if you've ever seen the Mandelbrot set before, this is one way to define it. Uh, you can start to zoom in and see some wonderful, strange pictures. This is your bad resolution, but you, the first one is I start zooming in over here. I then zoom in on this part over here. I zoom in on this part over here. And you see another copy of the Mandelbrot set living deep inside the original. And then this was, I think, you know, a really good one with cheesy music. You know, there should be at least one of those today. Really, how would you see that from the Pythagorean? See, now we've got the music. And then there's going to be some gratuitous rotation. I believe, yes, gratuitous rotation. There's absolutely no need to be rotating it like this. And now it's just starting to zoom in. And so it's right at that boundary. So at some point it's going to do it has to do something interesting it is a long video okay now we're getting to an interesting point it is an incredible calculation to be computing these well enough to show all these colors all right here we go Right, there you go. And this isn't even all the way there. You know, it's factoring in you know, 10 to the 275 in terms of just the number of iterations, how much it's zooming in. And there is another copy of it. You know, to do this calculation is truly impressive. I wrote a program, anybody know the language Pascal? For years, it was done by people who, you know, this way you don't have to go all the way to C. It's sort of an intermediate between basic and C. Is not worth learning, but to calculate all this, you have to be extremely efficient to get all these different colors. And so, what I hope you got out of today was a couple of things. So, one, the importance of asking the right question, finding what is the right thing to study. Dimension is something we've talked about for years. This is multivariable calculus. The big thing we're doing is we're looking at calculus, which start off in one dimension and we're extending it to three dimensions or to n dimensions. You could actually extend these to fractional dimensions. So you can actually have fractional derivatives. And there is applications of this in economics. You're taking a fractional derivative of something. What's the half derivative of something? So if anybody's looking for a project to do, these are great things to invest in. All right, this is a good place to stop. Have a great day.